Everyone, uh, please welcome Joaquin Breitner. He, he's a researcher at uh, Definity. He does a lot of work for the GAC steering committee and helps make sure ASCO evolves in the right direction. He's also very interested in formal methods and verification, being responsible for the tool uh, ASCO to COC and the development on liquid ASCO. Please uh, welcome Joaquin. All right. Um, thanks for the introduction. I, I just had a lot of echo. I hope that goes away. Okay. Sorry. I guess I had the Twitch stream open in some background. Okay. Uh, ready to start. Um, well, thanks for the introduction and welcome to my talk. I'm going to talk about the many phases of uh, is order tree. So what is this about? Well, it's about a very small, typical programming exercise or thing you might just come along in your daily work with Haskell. And it's not really a hard problem. It's about trees. And it's about uh, the question, you get given a binary tree um, like this one with uh, some data in the leaves, sorry, in the nodes, is this tree ordered? And with whether the tree is ordered, I mean, um, is for every node, is the value larger than everything on the left and uh, smaller or equal than everything on the right? Now, if I would give that program exercise to most of you, I'm sure you would just solve it without a big problem. The interesting thing here is that you would probably solve it in very different ways. So, so very roughly, there are three typical solutions to that problem. Um, you can either pass more information down as you traverse the tree. So you'd learn about something of the context of the subtree you're looking at in order to decide whether this subtree is at the right place inside the tree. Uh, Joaquin, sorry to interrupt you. Um, yes. Are you sharing your screen? Uh, people can see the, the slide. Oh. Uh, I guess you. Oh, I guess you stopped my video and I didn't uh, restart. Okay. Okay. Oh. There we go. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, right. So here's an example of that of a tree like this. Um, and the question is, is it ordered? And um, the ways to do that is if you um, you either pass additional information down. So as you traverse the tree, you think about okay, what what do I need to know looking at a subtree about its context in order to decide whether the whole tree is still in, in the right shape? Or you could go the other way. You could go from bottom up, look at each subtree individually, and then pass the information that you need upwards. Or the th third way that you typically see is you traverse the tree uh, from left to right. So you just traverse all the nodes in the right order that you expect them to be, and you check that they're actually um, an increasing sequence. Now, the point is not so much that there's multiple ways of solving this problem. This, again, is not so interesting per se. But the point of this talk is to show you that all these solutions are actually connected. And they're connected by small rewrites of a program, small transformations that preserve, obviously, hopefully, preserve the meaning of the program. And in fact, we can start with a very high level um, implementation of the solution of, of this problem uh, that is basically derived from the specification that you see written on this slide. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to do live coding and uh, wish me luck that this goes well. So I'm going to start with writing, uh, well, first we need a data a type for the tree. So a binary tree is either um, a leaf or it's a node with a left tree, a value, and a right tree. I'm going to, using very short constructor names just to have less typing during the talk. And then I'm going to write a function is ordered, call it one because there are quite many ones, many versions of this function. And it takes one of these trees and then uh, it checks whether, I mean, we want to implement the specification. So I'm just going to just write down in Haskell what is written in prose. So at every node, and at every node, we can look at the left tree, the value in the right tree. We want to assert that all elements on the left in the tree are less or equal than x. And we also want to assert that all elements on the uh, right, in the right sub -tier, are larger or equal than x. I claim that this is pretty much written down the specification we have. And now we have to fill in these functions that we're missing. So there's a function every node. Um, and it, let's look at the type signature first. It takes a predicate that takes a um, subtree, a value in a subtree, it's a predicate, so it returns bool, and it goes through the tree and returns a boolean. I'm going to write this in this um, pattern where we have a go function that does the local um, traversal. So for a leaf, well, 
um, we return true. And for a node, we have to check that the predicate holds at this node. And then also we want to go to the left and we want to go to the right. The, the other function we're missing is this LMS function. Um, so this just takes a, a tree and returns a list of elements inside. So for a leaf, it's the empty list and for a node, it's um, all the elements in one subtree, then the element itself and the elements in the right subtree. Now we still have one compiler error and we need to say that for, of course we need to be able to compare the values in this tree. Okay, I've solved the problem, but this is maybe not the nicest solution that we want. So let's try to explore how we can transform this into different solutions. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna, well, I wanna copy this um, and then I wanna inline every node because I'm only using the function every node in this one single place. So let's just um, get rid of it. So first I'm gonna be naming the, this predicate as a local function. And now we can do the, beauty th the beautiful thing about Haskell. We can apply equational reasoning because here it says every node P. And here we have every node P on the left of an equality. So we can just replace it with the right hand side, which is go. Well, this doesn't quite work because we need to get this go into scope. So let's copy it here. And then we see that this function P is only used in one place, so we can copy that as well. So I'm gonna be taking this code and just plugging it into this function. And I'm gonna do a little bit of code cleanup here, just so that it looks nice. And we've written our second implementation of this code. There's no every node anymore. We have a simple code that just, well, does the things we want to the tree directly. So the next step um, is to observe, or might be observed, that we're always using all and elms together in this particular shape. So let's see if we can fuse these two functions. So what I wanna use, I wanna write a function, all elms, that takes a predicate and a tree and does the same thing as all composed with elms. Now this is my desire, this equality, but I can turn this into a definition. And this doesn't gain me much, but now I can start rewriting. So the first thing we always wanna do often is to case split on the two kinds of trees. So for a leaf, oh, let's have two copies. For a leaf, elms of a leaf, that's the empty list. All of the empty list is true, so that's done. And then for a node, um, again, we can now use copy and paste. Elms of a node is precisely this equation up here. So we can plug it in here. And now we know, and I'm gonna be slightly fast here, that all P um, distributes over list append or list concat. And then uh, on a singleton list, it's just P of X. Okay, this still compiles, but we haven't quite eliminated all in elements because it's now in here. But note that now we have something here in our code that looks precisely like the right-hand side of the equation we started with. So because in the equation, we should be able to replace this thing with the corresponding element of the left um, equation here. So let's, there should be just all lm pl, and then here, same thing, all lm pr. And now we have an implementation of all lm that does not mention all lm, so we completely eliminated them. But of course, now, and now we wanna use this in our is ordered, so we arrive at version three, which has all lm right and right and left. All right, so for the next version, we're gonna see, um, well, we're still doing two traversals. We're still calling something on both L and right, R, on, on the left and the right tree. And in fact, we can just group them together a little bit, and now we see that there's a common pattern. So let's try the same exercise again. I'm gonna copy this into is ordered form. And now I wanna have a, a function go that takes a predicate and a tree, and let's call it go prime. And it simply implements this pattern here. So it should be all elements of a predicate on the left tree and go on the, well, on the tree, whatever it is. So it should be T here. And again, this is our desire. And we can implement that. So for a leaf, it's simple. Uh, go, go of a leaf is true. All elements of a leaf is true, it's up there. So this is true. And then for a node, 
And you see, there's a certain pattern here, so it's getting somewhat repetitive. Um, and now we can just plug in the corresponding definitions. So for all elements, we have this code. And then for Go, we actually have the code up here. And now we can reorder these a little bit, group them by whatever subtree we are traversing. Um, so we first look at the predicate, we look at all elements on the left. Um, okay, now we see that there's two traversals of all elements with different predicates. Uh, well, checking whether one predicate holds for all elements and another predicate, we can just check both predicates in one go. So we can replace it with lambda that looks at all elements, it says p is true, and also it should be less or equal than x. We do the same thing here. Um, P is true, and uh, now we have to do the different one. So y is larger than. Okay. And now again, we're in the situation that this code looks precisely like the right-hand side of the function we want to do, we want to create. So we can replace this with go prime on left and go prime on right. Um, something, oh yeah, I have to, and okay. Um, can we get rid of go now? Well, not quite, it's still being used up here. So how can we replace this code with go prime? We want to use go prime, the goal. Well, we have to somehow get into this shape. So we need to put something in front of it that's all alum, some predicate T, but it shouldn't change the semantics of the code. So what predicate can we put in here that doesn't change anything? Well, the predicate that's just always true because then all elements will always return true. And when this refactoring wouldn't change anything. And now we again in this particular shape here. So this become, can become go prime and we can eliminate go. And we can eat a contract. Thanks, Kitchland. And we have our next solution. Um, so the, let me put in a type signature here. This is because this is actually interesting. So this takes a predicate on elements. So it's A to bool, takes a tree and returns a bool. And actually we'll want to say order of A. So the next step is slightly larger than I would want to, and I could break it down in smaller steps, but in the interest of time, I have to do some kind of leaps. So in the next step, I want to have a close look at this type here. This is the type of all possible functions from A to bool. But this actually, this type is too big. It has many values that we never, will never occur in this program. Because if you look closely, we see, well, here we create one, of val one value of this function type. It's true everywhere. And then here we modify these predicates to restrict them with an upper bound or a lower bound. So really, I can see by looking at the code and where we use this type that we're just describing intervals on A, um, possibly open. So what I want to do is I want to now refine the type. And refine here means I'm going to look at a type that I'm using in my program. I'm going to replace it with a different type that is still has all the information that we need, but maybe less redundant information. And well, it's an interval, so it's somehow lower bound and upper bound. But it could be, uh, oh, sorry, no, this is a different one. Um, so it's an interval, but it's an open interval. So it could be that the lower bound or the upper bound is not there. So with this refinement in mind, I can now rewrite my code. So this should, I want to pass down these intervals, not the functions themselves. Of course, now I get lots of errors. Here I'm using the interval. Now I need to, instead of use the function, I need to interpret the interval. So I'm going to look at, um, I'm going to do pattern matching here, lower bound, upper bound. I want to do something like um, lower bound is less or equal than x and x is less or equal than upper bound. Um, Actually, like, write it like this, x is larger or equal than lower bound. Now this doesn't quite work because it's maybes, but I can just use maybe true and put this in as the predicate. And this basically says, well, if it's nothing, then it's always, we don't have any restriction. And if it's um, just a value, then we do this comparison. Actually, well, let me um, write it like this so that it looks like my, like the other code that we use, okay. Um, now here it complains that, okay, it's not predicates anymore. Here, I wanna, here we already determined that we're restricting the upper bound of the interval. 
So we should be able to just, just write that. Um, so the lower bound stays the same and the upper bound is now X. And here the same thing. Here I actually did some little bit of semantic reasoning because um, as it turns out, we only, like if the interval were already shorter and had like stopped before the X, then this would be wrong. We would be extending the interval, which was not the code that was there before. But we know from looking at these checks up here that for example, the upper bound, if it exists, is definitely larger or equal than X. Um, so, so therefore it's okay to unconditionally restrict the interval. But this is actually requires a little bit of semantic thinking about the code. Oh, and then we still have to update the initial thing. Initially, we don't have any bounds, so it's um, nothing, nothing. All right, and now we've reached the first of the three solutions that are outlined. This is the one that takes the traversal. And because this type is too weak to express this as an, in a compositional way, we pass down additional information in the actual traversal of the tree to know where the subtree has to be in. And we update this as we go down. And then we return a bool. And I would argue that this is the minimal amount of information we need because we didn't know the, the bounds if they are there. So we've reached in a way uh, an idiomatic solution by a program derivation. All right. On to the next one. And in this case, I'm going to backtrack to is order two and going to start from here. And this is going to be my new is ordered six. And now again, I want to go, want to fuse two traverses of the tree. In this case, I want to fuse alums and go. I want to just collect the two information in one go. So I'm going to write um, a function go on trees that does the same thing as go and also elements at the same time. And then we, you know the dance, uh, we have the, we use this as a definition starting point, then we do case splitting, go of t is true, elements of the empty list is the empty list, then the node, and now we plug in the corresponding code. Now this actually needs some space. So let me do it like this. Go of a node is this beast. And alums is somewhere up here. Now let's try again. Okay. And we've implemented go prime. Now we want to use it, of course, here. Um, and because it's returned a tuple, it returns tuple, it's actually nice to just set um, like pattern match on it. So we call a go prime on the left, and then we bind the result into like um, this destructed into go left and alums left, and then the same thing with right. And we use these here and, and here and here and here and here and here. And now let's make agent happy. Um, okay, so we've, we've made sure that Go Prime only uses itself in its traversal, but we also need to use Go Prime here. And we originally we were interested in Go T, and Go T is the first element of this tuple. So let's use just get this out of the of Go Prime, and we can go to the of Go. Not necessarily an improvement of the code in terms of clarity or simplicity, but it's it's a step. So the next step is again a refinement step. So let's look at this and maybe let's add a type signature here. Um, so this was taking a tree and returning a Boolean and uh, a list of elements. Just copy this here just for completeness. Um, but note that for this type bool of list of aim, and again, this requires a bit of looking at the code. We only ever care about this element, this part of the tuple if the Boolean says true. If the Boolean says false, it's yet we're already in, like, in the case where something's wrong and we just don't care about anything any more, thing anymore. So, but this means the type is, not, is too, uh, too big. We don't care about the value of the list when the, value is, uh, when the Boolean is false. So it might be enough to just take the list and wrap it in a maybe saying that, well, if in this code it's true and some list, then that's just, just the list. 
But if it's false and anything, we don't care, that's nothing. So this is a smaller type in a way, and it should have enough information to implement the code. So with this recipe, let's rewrite our code. Uh, true and the empty list, that's just, um, just the empty list. And then um, here we need to do this monad thing. And, and now we, I'm gonna be very lazy. I'm gonna use the do notation for maybe, which means that whenever something turns nothing, it, the whole result turns nothing, which is precisely what we want here. So there is, this becomes um, a, a do, a bind to the do notation. And again, same thing for write. Now we need to check these conditions. We can use the guard operator here. We don't need to check these booleans anymore. That's implicit in the do notation. And then we return the elements. Okay, um, and then here this has to change the well. Instead of looking at the first element, what we care about now is whether this is the boolean was true or false. And we can check that using is just. Now this requires a few imports. So let's import data maybe and control monad. And now this code actually compiles. But we can now do even more refinement. Like this doesn't stop here. So the next thing I wanna, well, the next thing is not a refinement, it's a preparation to what's that, but a um, little bit of arithmetic. Checking whether all elements of a list are less or equal than X. That's equivalent to saying that the maximum of the list should be less or equal than X. And then similarly here, we want to take that the minimum of the list on the right is larger or equal than X. Now minimum and maximum are partial functions, which is um, a bit dangerous. So we need to make sure, remember that we have to check that, um, well, we only check this if the list is not null. If it's null, then we're also fine. There's nothing to check. Okay, this was a very small local change, um, not a big refactoring, but it, it helps us go to the next step because now we can carefully look at our code and notice that the maximum is always the last element in the list and the minimum is always the first element in the list. Now, of course, this requires a bit of non-log reasoning. We have to look at all the cases where we do, do something with these lists, but we can check that, that well, if this list here is uh, not empty, then the maximum, the last element comes from this list. And because all elements in this list are larger than X and all elements in X are larger than this list, then the maximum is still on the right. And if this is not there, then X is the, the last element and X is also the maximum because X is larger than elements, all elements on the left. I'm speeding this up a little bit. Um, okay. And from this point, we can do a refinement again. Namely, we can notice that we don't really care about the whole list. All we care about is the first and the last element. Well, no, the list might be empty when we don't have any first last elements, so maybe this type would work better. And the mapping is, well, the empty list is nothing. And any other list is uh, just, and then the first and last element. And again, we can apply this refinement throughout the code. So instead of um, this list of A, we return a maybe tuple and we've nested maybes, but that's sometimes fine. The empty list becomes nothing. The, here we have to first check whether it's nothing or not. Um, well, they only have to check something if it's not nothing. So we can use the for combinator here. Um, so if there's a lower bound and upper bound, then we want to check that the upper bound is less or equal than X. This is the same the equivalent code to this line. And we can do the same thing for the right. We want to check that the lower bound is larger or equal than X. Um, okay, we need to import something for this. So let's get foldable into scope. Uh, now here we are assembling lists. Now we no longer deal with lists. We need, we need to deal with uh, these bounds. So we need to replace the operations. The singleton list, that's just, just XX by virtue of this definition. And then the concat, well, we need to find a definition that concatenates these things, but that's actually simple um, because, sorry. Because nothing 
and an element is an element. Um, nothing on the other side doesn't change anything. And then we have the case where we have bounds and then we only care about the lower bound from the thing on the left or the first, I should say the, the leftmost element of the underlying list and the rightmost on the other side. And then we just return these two. And this compiles and it looks like we're done. And this may be less nice looking code, but I would say this is the one possible idiomatic way of implementing the other direction that I said. The one where you um, look at the subtrees and you elaborate the result that you pass up to be more than just the bool because the bool is not enough information, but instead you pass, if everything is fine so far, information about abstract information about where does this subtree live, subtree live. And as you go up, you can um, make sure that this stays, uh, this is what you expect for a sorted tree. All right, so we have the second solution. Oh, and, and again, I would argue that this is the, the smallest type that you can put in here if you wanna go in for a bottom-up solution because you need to know is, is the subtree sorted? Is it empty or not? If it's not empty, what are the extremal points of the subtree? All right, for the next direction, I'm gonna start with is ordered six, which is this ugly beast. And now we're doing a, I guess it could, oh, sorry, this should be 11 now. Also some kind of refinement. In a way, looking at this type here, the bool and the list, I claim that for every element of the bool and X, really we will have that the boolean says nothing else than whether the list is sorted. Um, and we can, we can check whether this property holds for all elements that we pass around of, of this type by looking at the case that we constructed. So it trivially holds here, and then does it hold for this? Well, if LML L is sorted and LM is right is sorted and all the elements in the left are less or equal than X and all elements in the right are larger or equal than X, then yes, this is sorted. We could make this proof more elaborate, but um, for now this, this needs to do. But if that's the case, then this type is actually redundant because all the information that we need is already in here. We don't even need the Boolean. Well, so let's get rid of it. Um, so here we return the empty list. Uh, here we don't need a tuple anymore. Um, we don't need the first element of this tuple. Now we can just inline least definition. And we don't need the odd constraint. But of course, we need to fix something else. Previously, we were using first here on this tuple, but there's no longer tuple. But we know that the thing we would have gotten out is just sort, oh, should be excess, um, sorted list of the second element. So we can write sorted list. Oh, okay, now we need to write sorted list, but that's a simple exercise. The empty list is, uh, is sorted, uh, one element list is sorted, and any other list is sorted if the first element is less or equal than the second element and the remaining list is sorted. Careful, this Y needs to be there, otherwise uh, it's broken. And now we have our next solution. Um, let me tweak this a little bit. So one thing that I don't like about this, and this is a little bit of detour, a bit part of from our, apart from the main topic here, is that we use um, list concatenation here, which is quadratic and slow and everything. Now, a toolbox that, a tool that you should have in a toolbox for dealing with these kind of things are difference lists. Different lists are like lists, but they allow you to concatenate uh, in, in constant time. And you do not need a library to use them. You don't need to like go to hackers and look for different lists because they're really simple to just use inline. Whenever you have a type that's a list that you want to modify this way, change it into a function from list to list, the empty list becomes the identity. Uh, list concatenation becomes function composition. A singleton is just X prepended to a list. And uh, when you actually want to use it as a list, you have to apply it to the empty list. And now we've just changed the algorithmic complexity of this function a lot from uh, good enough for textbook, but I would not want to write that in real code to uh, this is probably fine. Now, many of you might have noticed that this go prime, this is really nothing else than um, 
to list because it's just traversing the thing and creating a list. Um, now, I don't even have to write to list. I can tell GHC to derive it for me with the right extension. And now this code even compiles. So really a nice solution is to write this together with this helper function and be done with. And this is um, the left to right solution that I was uh, hinting at, which has the nice property in Haskell because of laziness that you're actually creating a full copy of the whole array and then traversing it. But these two functions, the sorted list and the two list that we've written here or could derive from, from THG will actually work in lockstep. So you're really just looking at the things in sequence, but in a very elegant way. Um, so that's the third solution. And um, that's what I wanted to show you uh, within these uh, 30 minutes. So the summary is, as in many languages in Haskell, there are many, there's more than one way to do it. And that's a good thing because different ways might have different benefits. But the nice thing about Haskell and the tools we have, because we have this pure language, we can do equational reasoning, um, is that we can connect them. We can modify our code using, using these techniques. Some of these techniques you will actually find in a compiler. So some of the translation we did had strong similarities with what GHG does when it applies the worker wrapper transformation. But it's also useful, not just for a compiler writer, to, but also just for a developer to know these kind of transformations and how you can apply them um, to get safely from one, to safely refactor your code. I'm not suggesting that you write your code this way that I did with, you know, like the comments and then the copy and paste very carefully. So this works also nicely just mentally. You, you think, okay, I've determined this type is a bit too large. I want to make it smaller, more precise. And then just go through the code and you, you update based on type errors and you think about, okay, what is the relation between the old type and the new type? And this will help you refactor your code. Um, a little cliffhanger. Um, so I've claimed that all these transformations don't uh, preserve the meaning of the program. And in some way they do, and in some other way they don't. And that depends very much on type class laws and that they're relevant. Um, but I will not go into detail at this now because at this point I'd like to thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm looking forward to the Q&A in the chat room afterwards.